We're going to read God's Word from Luke chapter 1 and reading the first four verses. Luke chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 4. Let us hear the Word of God. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. We thank God for the reading of his precious and holy word. I want to consider with you briefly this morning the subject a most certain faith. A most certain faith. We know very little about Luke. What we do know and what we know is very important. There are only three places in the, in the New Testament where Luke is mentioned by name. Regarding his person, Paul writes in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician. Luke, the beloved physician. Regarding his work in Philemon and verse 24, he is called a fellow laborer of the Apostle Paul. And then lastly, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, when Paul is at the very end and facing his martyrdom, Paul could say, only Luke is with me. Luke wrote the third gospel. He also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. And yet in those 52 chapters, he never once refers to himself by name. One who was loved, one who labored, and one who remained faithful to the end, and yet never once referred to himself, shows the immense humility of such a man. This one who was not one of the apostles, but was indeed a minister of the word and a fellow laborer with the apostles. Just as Mark's gospel was written by the one who, was, who labored with the apostle Peter, Luke's gospel is written by the one who labored with the apostle Paul. Also, he wrote the most detailed gospel. It's the longest of the four gospels. And he also wrote the only inspired history of the apostles in the book of Acts. This morning we are to consider these four verses, as we have said, under the title, A Most Certain Faith. But let me clarify how we are using that word. We use the word faith in scripture, and scripture uses the word for the act of believing. But that's not the way we are using it uh, this morning. We're using it more like what Jude says, when he talks about contending for the faith, the body of doctrine, the, the body of the written faith, that which has been set down before us. This is the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Or as Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, where he says, hold fast the form of sound words. This is the faith, and this is the faith that is certain, that is sure. I remember many years ago listening to a, a, a sermon by Spurgeon where he talks about that our faith is no fiction, but it is fact. It is a real thing. It is a certain thing. 
in looking at these four verses this morning, I want to look at it under these headings. Our faith is certain, and the faith is certain because of witnesses. Witnesses that are many, witnesses that were eyewitnesses, witnesses that were faithful witnesses, and then the purpose of their witness. So first of all, in verse 1, many witnesses. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. The Jewish nation was a nation like others who wrote down their history, wrote down their experience, wrote down their faith. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into the world, many took it in hand to write down what they had seen and what they had heard. In fact, they could not resist. They were compelled, humanly at least, to write down what was happening, to record for uh, the world indeed what the Lord Jesus was saying and doing. Now it is good to have history. It's good to have the words of men and we think of men like Tacitus the Roman and Jewish historians like Josephus and so on and Aristotle and Plato and all these uh, other writers. That's good and they are profitable things to read but it's far better to have the inspired words of God and that's why when Luke says those things which are most surely believed among us he is talking about believers he's not just generally talking about history but that which we place our soul upon that which we trust our soul to so this is not just historical curiosity but that which we believe in for the sake of our salvation. Luke was not just a historian, though he was a historian and a faithful historian. He was essentially a theologian and a pastor. Indeed, the inspired author of the Word of God. And therefore, what we have read this morning is history, is the, the honest account of Luke's mind, but it is the words of the eternal God. And that's why we are gathered here this morning in, yes, it's a, a bright day, a sunny day, but a cold day, but we're gathered here not because of some man who wrote words down 2,000 years ago, but because those words, those very words, are there by the inspiration of our God, the God who has given us faith in the faith, trust in the oracles of God. So the question comes to us this morning, do I surely believe these things? Do I really and truly believe the word of God? That's the challenge to our hearts this morning the Lord Jesus speaking to the, the two on the road to on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 says this O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets are not to believe all that the prophets have spoken it's not enough just to give acknowledgement that this is the word of God we must surely we must certainly believe and that's the burden of Luke as he writes these words that we would place all our trust in the word of God but not only is there many witnesses as verse 1 says and we are reminded in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about in the chapter 15 of all the different witnesses that witnessed the resurrection and he talks about 500 
that witnessed the resurrection. Not only was there many, and not only was there many who took in hand to write these things down and to give their uh, witness to that, but there were eyewitnesses. Verse 2 says, Even as they delivered them unto us, which were from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Now Luke was not an eyewitness himself. He was taking all uh, the testimony of various eyewitnesses. And actually this gives us, this is not a, a problem. Certainly uh, Matthew and John and, uh, and the writings of the apostles were eyewitness accounts. And you might say, well, hold on, Luke was not an eyewitness of all these things. But what he does is he brings together the collection of many eyewitness accounts of the Lord Jesus. And that's the reason why Luke is the longest gospel. Because Luke in that sense is a, a collection of all these testimonies. And that's the benefit. We're not just reading the, the words of God or even the words of one man. We're reading the collective testimony of of the eyewitnesses, those who saw Jesus, those who heard Jesus. As John puts it in his first epistle, in 1 John chapter 1, listen to what he says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it. We've seen it with our eyes. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Why? That you may have fellowship with us. Brothers and sisters this morning, the very basis and grounds of our fellowship together is in this word. That's what unites us together in the Lord Jesus Christ. John says that the reason he was writing is so that we might have koinonia, communion, fellowship with God and with each other by the word of God. But notice also the comprehensiveness and trustworthiness of these eyewitnesses. They were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. And that's why in Acts chapter 1, when the replacement for Judas is to be chosen, the apostles outlined that this must be one who had been with them from the beginning and right up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One who not only saw Christ and heard Christ, but saw the whole ministry of Christ, heard the whole teaching of Christ, as Paul could say to the Ephesian elders, that he declared unto them the whole counsel of God. These were eyewitnesses. These were first-hand witnesses of Christ. It's amazing that in 2,000 years, we can go right to the very ones who saw Jesus. We don't see him ourselves with our eyes, but we read the very words of those who saw him, of those who heard him. And therefore, we don't have to trust in, as some people say, you know, Chinese whispers that go through many generations. No, we have first-hand report, just as truly as in the courtrooms in Dublin City where somebody will take the stand and give an eyewitness account of a crime. The judge wasn't there. The jury wasn't there. But the witness was there. And the witness gives their honest account, their trustworthy account of these events. And therefore, when somebody asks you why you believe, one of the answers I often give is this. I believe the apostles. I believe they were honest men. I believe they were God-inspired men. 
There were men who lived and indeed died for the Lord Jesus Christ and their faith. But then thirdly, which we've already hinted at, faithful witnesses, many witnesses, verse 1, eyewitnesses, verse 2, but faithful witnesses, verse 3. Luke says, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee an order, most excellent Theophilus. Brothers and sisters, Apologetics is not designed for the convincing of the unbeliever, but for the assurance of the believer. And the Word of God in general is for that. The Word of God is not written for the unbeliever to be convinced. The Word of God is written so that the believer might understand what he believes in, so that we might be certain, so that we might be sure Theophilus was already a believer and Luke is writing to him so that he would fully understand these things and that he would be assured of what he believed. Paul puts it this way, quoting Psalm 116, where the psalmist says that we believe and therefore we speak. Paul says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Luke is writing to a contemporary, a believer, one who needed the assurance of faith, one who needed to know clearly and surely what Jesus said and did. Brothers and sisters this morning, our need 2,000 years later is no different. We have the same need that Luke perceived Theophilus had. And that was to know the real Jesus. We often say when we're preaching in Dublin City that the problem for people is that even those who say they believe in Jesus, they don't have the biblical Jesus. They have a Jesus of their imagination. The reason we are gathered this morning is so that we can gather around the Word of God to know the real Christ, to hear the real Christ, to worship the real Christ as the people of God. Many witnesses, eyewitnesses, faithful witnesses. But then fourthly and lastly, the purpose of all this. What's the purpose of many witnesses? What's the purpose of eyewitnesses? What's the purpose of having faithful witnesses? Again, it comes back to this point so that we can be sure so that we can be absolutely convinced of what we believe. And as I said about apologetics, one of the problems with modern day apologetics is that it really misses so often the real point. When Anselm and men in the past engaged in apologetics, it was not to put on conferences to try and convince the unbeliever. No, the, the primary focus was to reassure the believer. So when we study the, the Word of God and we compare it with the, the facts of science, the facts of astronomy and so on, that we can see that this is true, that the Bible is the Word of God, and the faith that we believe in and the gospel that we believe in is true, is certain. Another sermon that Spurgeon preached was on the subject of assurance. And he said something like this. He said that the fully assured Christian is like a giant, like a, a giant warrior in God's army. That the one thing we should strive for, that the one thing we should truly strive for is to be assured, is to be certain, not to waver, 
not to be like a shifting shadow, not like not to be like a, ch a child tossed to and fro by every, every wind of doctrine, but to stand on the sure ground of God's word and to know whom we have believed and therefore to speak because we believe so that Peter, as Peter says to us, that we might always be ready to have an answer for those that ask us, why do you believe? Peter says the way that we be ready is this, to sanctify Christ in your heart. To sanctify Christ in your heart. To know him in his word. To be assured that this is the savior of the world. That this is the word of God. That this is not fiction. This is fact. And therefore, the purpose is that we might be certain of those things. Luke's motive is for one. It's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? We read the Gospel of Luke. We read the book of Acts. And both of those books were written to one person. It says something about the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That the Lord always focuses on the one. And even as we are gathered together as a small company of God's people God is looking at each one of you and looking at your hearts individually just as Christ met with the the woman at the well and many other individuals it's the individual there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents the purpose is that every individual Christian might be certain brothers and sisters we can gather here but have a lot of confusion in our hearts we can have a lot of confusion in our hearts how are you this morning are you sure or are you confused you're not quite sure listen if you're not sure seek the Lord seek the Lord today confess to another believer say you're not sure because if you're not sure, if you're not certain, nothing else matters. The very reason why the Gospel of Luke and the whole of the Word of God was written is that every believer might know the certainty and the sureness of these things. We live in a time of a lack of certainty. People don't know what to think. People are literally running around like the proverbial headless chicken, following the next wind of doctrine and just wanting someone to lead them, to tell them what to do. We are like sheep, aren't we? The sad thing is that so often we follow the uncertain things rather than coming back to that which is certain. The only thing that's certain is the foundation God's word it's the only thing that's why John says at the end of his gospel Luke says it at the beginning of his John says it at the end of his that these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God you see our faith is logical it makes sense it makes absolute sense the reason why so many reject Christ it's not because it's illogical or it doesn't make sense. It's because they don't want to submit to his lordship. Peter, as we close, puts it this way. As he talks about the writing the word of God, he says, I will endeavor, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things in remembrance. What Peter is saying is when I die, I want to leave something that matters. Probably that's true of all of us. Peter says, I want to leave something that's going to count for something. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. This is not make-up stuff, Peter, Peter says. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his, get this, of his majesty. In other words, what Peter says, we saw more than just a man with good words. 
we saw more even than miracles. We saw the majesty of God. We saw it with our own eyes. We witnessed the majesty of Christ. Even as we looked a few weeks ago in Luke 5, the great catch of fish, Peter falls down his knees and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You see, there's a real sense, brothers and sisters, that we will only see Christ when we're certain that this is the Word of God. When we are sure that this is the oracles of the divine. And therefore, Paul could say at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, we'll close with this verse. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why? Because we know that these things are true. We know that this is not fiction. This is fact. We know that this is a sure and certain faith. May God make each one of us certain of that truth. Amen. Amen. Let us sing from Psalm 116. Psalm 116. The verse that Paul quotes from is in verse 10 of this psalm. Psalm 116. We're going to sing from verse 9. Three stanzas to the end of the psalm. I in the land of those that live will walk before the Lord. I did believe, therefore I spake. I was afflicted sore. I said when I was in my haste that all men liars be. What shall I render to the Lord for all his gifts to me? Psalm 116. Let us stand to sing verses 9 to the end of the psalm. I in the land of those that live will walk the Lord before. I did believe, therefore I spake. I was afflicted so. I said when I was in my haste that all men liars be. What shall I render to the Lord for all his gifts to me? I love salvation, take the cup, on God's name will I call. to the Lord before his people love. Dear in God's sight is his saints death, thy servant Lord am I. Thy servant should thine hand made so. It's on time. Thy offerings I to thee will give, and on God's name will call. I'll pay my vows now to the Lord before his people. Within the courts of God's own house, within the midst of thee, O city of Jerusalem, praise to the Lord give ye. Let us pray.
Our Father, we pray that above all, as we have considered thy word today, Lord, that we would know the assurance of knowing the true Christ revealed to us by thy servants so that we would live in the midst of an uncertain world, an uncertain time, we would have that blessed confidence, that firm foundation, knowing that the faith which was once delivered unto the saints is the certain truth of God, so that we might take our stand not on the imagination of our own brains, but on the declaration of divine truth. Lord, that we would know whom we have believed, and that we would be convinced that he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day, that we would know the true God, that we would know Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, that we would know that we are the people of God, based on that fellowship that we have with the Father, with the Son, in the Word inspired by the true and living God, and that we as the body of Christ would be that body, and the Word of God would flow through the veins of His church, and that we would live and breathe and feed upon that Word. Lord, bless us, forgive us for our failings, our sins, our wanderings, our backslidings. O oh Lord, help us, draw us closer to Christ this Lord's day, and bless thy people. And now the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and sweet communion of the blessed Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.